Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining me for this week's edition of the SMIE Consulting Midweek Roundup. It's Wednesday, October 23rd, 2024, and this week we're going to be answering three questions we've been hearing from international educators over the last seven days. And as we do each week on the Roundup, we take our questions that we ask here on Wednesday afternoon from our newsletter that comes out on Mondays. And that newsletter is called All the SMIE News Fit to Share, and that includes stories related to social media implications, webinars, data reports, online, AI, anything that uh, might impact international education, and also uh, includes a, a significant roundup of both U.S. Uh, international education news, uh, solutions, and we focus here on solutions here at SMIE Consulting, as well as a global roundup of what's happening in other major destination markets and how they are grappling with the issues of the day related to international education. So uh, as we do each week on the roundup here, we cover uh, themes we see developing in the newsletter on Mondays. We cover more in depth uh, our questions uh, that we answer here today related to uh, those topics. So we are uh, interested in first uh, sharing with you uh, the subscription link to our website, smieconsulting.org slash subscribe, where you can subscribe to that newsletter if you prefer to get an email version of it. Uh, and I'll also drop the link to this week's edition into the chat so you can have that for your reference. And in terms of the other major way we like to get our news, and I know I like to get my news uh, other than email subscriptions, is from LinkedIn. And uh, if you do get your, uh, prefer your international ed news from LinkedIn, we have a version of that available. And the LinkedIn version plus the, uh, plus the email version of this newsletter uh, have uh, between them well over 2,200 subscribers. So very excited about what that means. Uh, for our international education community around the world, uh, majority in the U.S., but those that see the value in the content that we're putting out in the newsletter and then here again on the Roundup, our podcast version, audio-only podcast version of the Midweek Roundup is uh, has been downloaded over almost 4,000 times, so we're very excited about the breadth and the reach of our content that we deliver weekly free of charge to our international education peers around the country and indeed the world. So if you are ready to go, we'll jump right into the first uh, question of the week and that is, is it now the rule that we must diversify or die when it comes to international student recruitment? And this is coming out of a, a webinar and a white paper uh, that are being put out by OIEG and that's Oxford International Education Group, for those not familiar, uh, that OIEG has run a series. They're kind of a, a master agent uh, in the business. They run uh, programs for about half a dozen or so U.S. universities now. Obviously, it's a U.K.-based uh, organization uh, working with U.K. universities as, as well as U.S. institutions, and I think maybe some Australian ones as well. And they're newer to the U.S. market. I only, as I said, they only have about a half dozen partners now. But uh, they are uh, put out this white paper and are doing a webinar. So it's kind of a double whammy. Good timing for them. Uh, makes sense uh, to uh, combine uh, those efforts uh, and obviously have something to talk about. So the, the webinar is this coming uh, Tuesday next week at 11 a.m. Eastern. Uh, that is called A Lack of Diversity Spells Adversity. The Imperative for U.S. Campuses to Diversify Their International Student Population. And it's got some fairly significant players, Ravi Shankar from University of Rochester, Samrat Ray Chaudhary uh, from Webster University, Tanya Creamer from OIEG, and Alex Korda also from OIEG. So uh, the two big players there, Rochester and Webster, on the university side will share their experiences talking about the need for diversity. Now, in terms of why uh, diversity is so important, we see story after story of this happening uh, to institutions, not just in the U.S., but in Canada, Australia, uh, in, in the U.K. as well. Institutions that might not be top-tier institutions, but have very significant international populations on the surface. Oftentimes, when you scratch a little bit below and dig a little deeper into their actual numbers, uh, oftentimes they can be heavily dependent on one or two countries. And when I say heavily dependent, I'm talking 
50 to 60 percent or more dependent on students coming from one country. We saw this extensively in Canada where the public-private partnerships at a lot of uh, vocational colleges in, in Canada led to institutions going all in on, on India and having 70, 80 percent at some of these private institutions, up to 90 percent of their students being from India, total students, not just international students, total students. And those are significant, obviously, uh, for a healthy balance. If, for example, there happen to be political upheaval between those two countries, uh, yours and the students from, from which uh, country you're recruiting most heavily, that can have huge economic consequences. There are uh, private uh, colleges in Canada that have had to close or are under now under uh, in the past before these uh, before the recent uh, caps that were put in place last year on Canadian international students uh, receiving study permits and again next year uh, you saw some 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 of these uh, private colleges that were so dependent on students from India having to close there were some irregularities some uh, some fraud going on in some of these uh, some of these places that they, they all they saw was dollar signs and that is the the risk that a lot of institutions take when they invest, not just in, in Canada, but this isn't true in the US, it's true in, K in the UK, it's true in uh, Australia. And again, I'm not just, I'm not talking the, the well-known schools where this happens, uh, though some have gotten heavily dependent in China in the past, uh, uh, certainly University of Illinois, it got to the point where they even took out insurance policies to make sure that they were uh, covered in case there was a drop off in Chinese students attending uh, their institution. So there are uh, countless examples of big, small institutions alike and everywhere in between that have put so many of their international student recruitment eggs in one or two country baskets to uh, allow them to bring in the revenue they need to keep doors open, to fund new activities, to recruit more international students, whatever the, whatever the rationale may be. There are so many examples of this that uh, the need for diversifying and relying on more than a couple countries for the bulk of your international students is a priority uh, for U.S. institutions and, U and institutions around the world that are looking to enroll significant numbers of international students. Uh, we've always talked about that in the United States. We, one of the reasons we're not in the financial predicament that a lot of UK universities are facing, that a lot of Canadian colleges and some universities will be facing in the coming year or two, that Australian universities will face, is we aren't as dependent on international students overall in the United States for our higher education enrollment. Uh, right now we're at five to six percent. In the UK, Canada, Australia, they're 25, 30, 35 percent or more. Uh, as an average for their institutions. They have many fewer institutions. Canada has around 100, UK 150 or so. Canada also has a number, a couple hundred uh, colleges as well, vocational colleges uh, that can be counted in that mix. And then you have Australia with uh, only 40 universities and then a number of vocational colleges. So uh, there's far fewer to go around for all the international students that they enroll. So their percentages of student populations on those campuses and all three of those other major countries are very significant numbers. So financial implications when you start losing uh, significant numbers from any one country, when you're so dependent on international students for your overall revenue uh, situation, you do get into uh, some very significant financial concerns. There are layoffs coming at a lot of institutions in Canada, UK, Australia. There will be shuttering of departments. There will be downsizing in, in some, some respects. So there are some real concerns when you become so heavily dependent on international students in general, but specifically when you become so dependent on one or two countries. And I mentioned that this is not just a, a Canadian, Australian, uh, UK phenomenon. Uh, you see, uh, you see, have seen recently that uh, international students are uh, are running into some major uh, major challenges uh, in, uh, in in getting visas from certain countries, and uh, visa visa say visa approval rates were down significantly. In India this year, when most country, most colleges had, had gone all in in India in the last couple of years, some institutions uh, became so heavily dependent that there's a story that was in our newsletter this week where um, St. Louis University in uh, my home city, St. Louis, Missouri, uh, had was expecting over 1,300 new international students this fall, graduate students this fall, and ended up only getting 300. And that 1,300 was based on previous year's enrollments. 
So to have 1,000 fewer students uh, enroll, and it, the article didn't specify, but I've since learned that it's uh, from countries in South Asia, in, in India, and Bangladesh, where they en enrolled a huge number in the previous year, or expected to enroll that number again, didn't get those enrollments. And as a result, they are short 1,000 international students at the graduate level that pay on average $36,000 per head. So that's a $3.6 million, 3.6 or 36? $36 million uh, budget shortfall that they're now grappling with. I think the article says it's only 20, but uh, if you just calculate out the 1,000 fewer international students they were expecting, that's $36 million in tuition revenue. So that certainly leaves a massive hole, and uh, certainly that institution isn't the only example of that, but that's certainly one that popped up even in the last week. So the reliance, the overall dependence uh, of some institutions on students from one or more countries uh, is a significant challenge. Uh, just to give you a perspective, uh, we are, uh, we certainly don't have the volume that uh, St. Louis University has, but uh, at UNLV in this past intake, we had uh, just under 300 new international students, both undergrad and grad. Those uh, students were spread out uh, across 55 different countries. And the largest single number we had from any one country was 26, or excuse me, 35 from China, 26 from India, 23 from Iran and South Korea, and then 16 from Nigeria and 15 from Vietnam. Those were our top countries. So we had over 10 countries that have double-digit new international students coming to us, none more than 35. So we have our diversity kind of going well at this point at, uh, at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. So uh, we are uh, we're not overly dependent on any, any one country. I think in our population of now over well over 1,200 international students from, uh, from first year undergraduate through to PhD students we have, and those on OPT, we have over 1,200 enrolled. And I think the only country, I think they're the largest single country in that mix is Korea. And we have about 150 or so from Korea. So uh, we are very well diversified in our international population, total of about 93 countries represented in the mix now. So that's where we are at UNLV. Fortunately, we're, uh, we don't have the volume that some of these other larger schools have. We're at over 1,000 international students, but uh, we are certainly on a growth trajectory, and part of that growth is focused on, on the diversification piece. So there was a Pi News article that covered the OIG uh, white paper, and it talks specifically about the U.S. in there and talks about the um, reason to become advocates for, for uh with your government, government affairs folks at your institutions uh, to talk about African student visa denials, um, talking about some of the larger source markets and some of the declines that have happened previously. Well, we, we've experienced actually an increase from China in the last couple of years, particularly at the grad level, after the drop-off happened with undergraduate Chinese. And uh, we certainly are expecting India to rebound significantly in the next year, particularly for the spring intake. So we, ha we are seeing a lot more positive m momentum, but the uh, OIG piece, their white paper talks about it, um, that uh, to, to help the reason for diversification is to avoid potential disruption. And that's something we certainly uh, all want at our institutions is to, to keep above the high water mark and keep our financially and uh, keep our, our uh, diversifying the sources of where our students are coming from. So that's our first question of the day. And I'm dropping the links to that webinar for OIG and then the Pi News article so that you can have, have that for your reference. Uh, now, with regard to the other major um, issues of the day, uh, beyond the diversification piece, we are seeing uh, issues that have we've talked about before here on the Roundup, and I guarantee you they're going to become even more important in the weeks and months to come. And that is question number two. Should U.S. colleges be ranked by outcomes for international students? Now, this is a pretty significant piece here. Uh, why is that important? Because we get so laser focused on rankings on quality, when, or how we're doing on Times Higher Ed, how we're doing on QS, Shanghai rankings, whatever it might be. There's so many rankings out there that it's, it's and I've never been a big advocate of rankings because I think they're, they're all, um, uh, all show ponies for how, how for reputation more than anything else. And, but there are a few that have popped up in recent years. I know uh, 
Um, Carnegie classifications are changing to also focusing domestically on outcomes, which is great. Uh, and now we have a new ranking uh, that our colleagues at F1 Higher are putting out. And that is called the, let's see, you get the official name of this ranking, so you get it right. Uh, I just wrote it down somewhere else and now I'm looking for it in an article and can't find it. But it is uh, Outcomes for International Students, uh, basically, and it takes uh, data from, uh, from, from this, uh, uh, for, excuse me, it takes data from uh, federal sources only, uh, av at looking at average salary, return on investment based on tuition, and the ratio of international students granted green cards and permanent residency. So this is a ranking that uh, is uh, focused on career outcomes. And it's become increasingly important uh, to do this because uh, since the pandemic, even before the pandemic, we're starting to see signs of it. The number one factor of, for prospective students in their choice of institutions was what the career outcomes were going to be, what the return on their investment was going to be, what the career services are like at the institutions that they're, they're going to be attending and having, uh, having data that they can see and find about uh, the, each institution that they're considering to see how international students and, are doing when they graduate. This one is probably the most granular focused uh, ranking on international students that I've seen. Certainly when it comes to the outcomes piece, it's the only one I've seen for specifically international students. And that's something that I think we can't ignore. Uh, and I think it's, I'm, uh, I'm sharing this data with, our, with our, um, our undergraduate education folks, with our career services folks, so that they're aware, hey, this ranking exists now. We're not on it, we need to be. So how do we, how do we improve what we're doing in terms of the services we're providing to our international students to increase their opportunities for jobs after graduation and those that choose to stay after OPT for H-1B and permanent residency, all of that. Are we tracking that? So uh, this, is, this is just a way for us to uh, showcase uh, and focus on in our, in our services to international students and provide the, the data if we can have it. And if not data, certainly the anecdotal stories of successful international graduates and what they're doing. And that will play well with your future student audiences. So it is a very cyclical thing. We use the successes of our international students, uh, salaries, job, percentage graduates, uh, number on OPT, what they're doing now, and those anecdotal stories to feed back into our recruitment process because that piece on focusing on demonstrated outcomes for your international students is a priority now. So how can we best do that? And so this, this survey I hopefully will kickstart some conversations on campus if it hasn't already. There's so much uh, good content in here and I, I really hope uh, more institutions uh, uh, pick, prick up their ears to this and make it a priority on their campuses to really focus on uh, identifying where the potential shortcomings are for their services meeting the needs of international students. It, particularly at that most important end, at the back end of their time on campus before they graduate, making sure they're ready and prepared for what's coming next. So there were a couple articles there, one from the Pi, uh, also one from The World uh, that talks about uh, graduating international students seeking work in the U.S. face complicated job search. So it's talking through that process and that how uh, one, of the, one of the U.S. Uh, campus-based people, immigration people uh, mentioned, hey, uh, employers need to be educated too. And it's not just career services that are responsible, it's not just international student offices that are responsible, but uh, our universities need to work with their partners, industry partners, to talk through, hey, these, are, these international students can legally work in the U.S. from one to three years after they finish their degree. And if you like them, then you can hire them on a more permanent base, semi-permanent basis through H-1B. So that's, that's that most, in, most organizations, most employers don't get that. And that's the part that's really down to uh, the employers, uh, the universities, to help educate the employers on what exactly is possible. So a uh, great uh, set of resources here on that. Uh, we, hear, we keep hearing from industry experts as well uh, that are uh, in the back end of the recruitment process, uh, of the student recruitment process, helping to get the messages out about institutions. They talk about here what they're hearing from prospective students and prospective parents about the process. So the articles that I've uh, put into the chat should hopefully give you some 
better examples of what to expect when, um, when institutions are grappling with these kinds of issues. So some really good content there to help uh, extend your reach uh, for the content that you're providing, uh, the data that you're collecting, uh, the markers uh, that you're tracking, the metrics that you're using to identify success for international students on your campus, because that has to be there. It's not just retention rate, it's not just graduation rate, it's employment rates, it's uh, persistence to graduate education if they're starting an undergrad, uh, what their average job salaries are, uh, those that continue on and get permanent residency or, H or first H-1B status, all of that are factors that we need to consider uh, and be able to eventually quanti quantify for future student audiences and their parents, because they matter. They, that data will matter, and if you have it, you're gonna be golden, and if it's good, obviously, uh, in terms of the kind of content that you can share with your prospective student audiences and their parents. So should U.S. colleges be ranked by outcomes internationally for their students and graduates? Absolutely. It's, it'll hold, hold some institutions' feet to the fire and hopefully get the kind of change necessary to make the, and put in place the services that really matter and can help improve your institution's standing when it comes to uh, getting your graduates jobs after graduation. And not just any jobs, but good jobs in their field that really elevate them and in the process elevate your institution's reputation, particularly with future student audiences. So that's the second question of the day. The final question is one that has been percolating for a while. And this is, a question that uh, it's not just being asked in Australia, it's being asked in, in Canada, it's being asked in the UK and, to, and in other countries to lesser extents. But what is the damage being done down under, really, in terms of the changes that the government has implemented or has already implemented and is about to implement caps in Australia? I think Canada's already done the same. The UK's imposed restrictions on um, students coming with dependents if they're not studying at the PhD level. Uh, there are other restrictions. They've increased the minimum salaries for graduates, uh, so that limits the opportunities for international graduates in the UK to get jobs. Canada is also preventing extensions on postgraduate work permission. They're in addition to the caps that they've already put in place. Uh, they're going to be expanding uh, the um, caps for another year. So there's continual damage going to be done there. In both those cases will cost billions of dollars, pounds, uh, Australian dollars, Canadian dollars, and British pounds in the process. So, down under, let's let's go deep with them today. Uh, there are three articles I'll share with you. Actually, maybe even four. Four. Uh, first one from the World University Rankings uh, that just came out uh, for the Group of Eight. And if you're not familiar with the Group of Eight, that's the equivalent of the Ivy League in Australia. They're, they're top eight institutions and uh, the most prestigious ones. Uh, they are, have seen drops in their rankings in World University Times Higher Ed rankings. So there are, uh, they have now six uh, universities, group of eight universities are in the top 100 rankings globally. So uh, there are opportunities uh, that the, pro the challenge has been they are dropping. Those research intensive unities in the group of eight are dropping and uh, just barely are hanging on to the top 100. So the rankings are, have always been seen as a, a point of pride for Australian universities. The more the institutions they can get in, they obviously have a very limited number of 40 or less. So uh, to get six in the top 100, that's a significant one. But when those rankings have been declining uh, for that, of the 38 universities that were ranked in the whole ranking system, 17 declined in performance and only four improved their position. So, uh, and the THE rankings highlighted uh, international ed policy as a reason for the decline. So, the drop in rankings is affecting Australian universities' prestige. And that's not a good thing when you're trying to build on uh, and grow your international enrollments, which is going to be a struggle for any Australian institution for the foreseeable future, uh, as long as these caps are in place. So, what will happen next? So let's talk about the uh, next level down uh, is we have uh, issues of uh, uh, another perspective on this from uh, a neighbor in South uh, in the South uh, Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean, and that's from their uh, cousins uh, in New Zealand. 
and they have uh, there's a, po a post there from Scoop in New Zealand that uh, certainly does put out regularly a bit of information on uh, international education uh, in Australia and in the region. And they had uh, made the point, uh, and one of the uh, one of the experts is is saying that uh, that the cap uh, that is uh, that Australia is about to put in place is runs contrary to what every uh, conceivable government sector person would would think would be reasonable, and that's because. Uh, one of the, the quotes that I, I really loved uh, coming out of this is that uh, is from, from a New Zealand perspective is that they are basically cutting off uh, one of their largest single export sectors. Uh, and the, the quote is, something strange is happening in Australia. The federal government is promoting legislation to reduce one of the country's largest exports, educational services. So uh, that will mean a cap of only 270,000 new international student visas being issued for 2025. And that will bring uh, the number uh, of students coming to Australian universities and vocational educational training institutions to pre-pandemic levels. So uh, that is going to be a significant financial cost to those institutions that are going to be enrolling far fewer students. Uh, we're looking at drops. Uh, we're, Australian uh, its numbers were closer, closing in on 800,000 total, and they're going to be capped for, and that was total in the country. Now they're going to be capped for new students in 2025 at 275,000. So quite significant drop. So that's uh, that, that report on the cap, uh, and from the New Zealand perspective, is, is very interesting. The next article that we'll talk about. Uh, reflects uh, kind of what the students, international students currently in Australia, kind of fighting back. And it's, it's good to see that. And you see these international students starting to mobilize and starting to show, uh, show how valuable they are to, uh, to, the, to the country. And you have, have that reflected in the, the rallying cry, you need us. International students protest recent visa changes, say they fear they may be forced to return home. Warning Australians, you need us. And that's from uh, the Australian, or news.com.au. Uh, so certainly um, that is a message that institutions certainly don't want to hear. Uh, the Australian institutions that are enrolling students, hearing that their students might have to return home, that uh, they have now uh, seen the government that welcomed them at one point turn against them. And that's a, that's a feeling. And you see, you see, you've seen that in Canada, that the, when you say cuts, when you see caps, when you see limits put in place, no matter how, what language you use to pretty it up and justify it, the intended impact of that, or the unintended consequence of that, is that it's reputationally damaging your country as a welcoming, welcoming place for new international students and immigrants in general. So this, uh, this migration overhaul, uh, that the Albanese government in Australia is undertaking as is going to have significant long-term damage. Now, what does that long-term damage mean? Uh, there's even a piece in uh, the Australian Financial Review that talks about five national security concerns. That, and that's something for, uh, for all of us to, to think about in the implications of reducing numbers of international students as having national security implications. This article from the Australian Financial Re Review, and thanks for tuning in, Artie, and uh, you're welcome to the links. And make sure you're subscribed to the newsletter. You get them already on Monday morning. So uh, please uh, check out those links to, to subscribe. Uh, but in terms of the uh, Australians and their, what they're looking at, this, uh, this, this article uh, in the Australian Financial Review talks about the how it's been well documented that international education is Australia's biggest export outside of mining and agriculture. So those, uh, these markets are particularly volatile when China economy is slowing and becoming less mineral dependent. That impacts those other areas. And now education, which could have been and should be uh, an important part of a national security policy, are just now being limited. That um, 
Uh, instead of being a super growth sector, as recently as 2016, international education was identified in Australia as a super growth sector uh, that uh, had the most per potential. The Albanese government is now condemning Australia to, a, in, in the quote from this article, to quote unquote, a future dependent on primary commodities exports that are subject to declining global demand. So, and uh, the, they make five reasons that, uh, in the article, why uh, Australians should be concerned. Uh, they talk about caps, further weaken the capacity of universities to invest in core research areas uh, that are contributing to dependence on other, co other countries for know-how in critical areas, such as energy, infrastructure, and technology. So, uh, it's, there are Australia, UK, US commitments that uh, in relation to high technology between the US, UK and Australia, uh, nuclear powered subs in exchange for contributing to building and maintenance of expanded nuclear sub fleet. Uh, and there are also some other uh, implications there. The caps diminish, uh, that diminish universities' ability to train and attract the world's leading researchers in effect will quote unquote reduce Australia's ability to build and service nuclear powered submarines and develop cutting edge defense technologies. Okay. Uh, that there's going to be lost talent uh, in this process, uh, impeding universities' capacity to drive technological advancement and increasing dependent, dependence on other nations, which we talked about. And that uh, third, caps undermine universities' capacity to build the student alumni groups who act as ambassadors and increase the goodwill and cross-cultural understanding that are key for national security. And certainly that's a view we have in the United States with our State Department's goal of um, mutual uh, understanding uh, as a main goal, promoting mutual understanding across uh, through the educational exchange. And fourth, uh, caps foster an external perception of isolation and isolationism and mistrust. So uh, they are damaging Australia's reputation abroad, like I like was sharing earlier. And finally, by encouraging a focus in a constrained environment on safe bets in terms of student recruitment, caps limit the capacity of universities to diversify their student base. They increase dependence on one or two markets. So when we come full circle. Uh, we were talking about uh, international diversification uh, at the first question today. and. One of the reasons, uh, one of the consequences uh, for Australia capping their international uh, students, it will limit their capacity uh, in Australia for universities to diversify their base. So they'll be increasingly dependent on one or two markets. So there we go. It's a rule that uh, does is becoming the norm. And as we talked about uh, throughout this this message today, and in other episodes of the Roundup, and in the newsletter that kind of diversification matters uh, because it, uh, it helps isolate or insulate, I should say, insulate your institution from the swings and roundabouts of global and political upheaval that affect uh, student flows from one or more countries. So when you're diversified, you're in a better position to survive longer term. So yes, diversify or die or suffer the consequences. So there's what we ha that's all we have for you this week on the Roundup. Thanks for jo jo joining in this week. And if you haven't already voted, if you're in the United States, please do so. Uh, if you're going to be out of town or out of the country uh, during Election Day, I know I will be. I voted today at uh, my local, uh, oh, where's my badge? Where's my badge? Yes, I voted in Ohio, yeah, at my local uh, county uh, election commission. So please vote. Uh, it matters what we do, uh, and it matters that we exercise our civic duty. And we hope all of you have that opportunity to do so where you can. And that's all we have for you today. We look forward to checking in with you next week. Cheers.